All right, awesome. Thanks, everyone. Uh, welcome to Net DevOps Live, live from Cisco Live. Uh, we're excited to be here today. We want to talk to you a little bit about it uh, as a panel about some of the trends we're seeing, uh, what people have been seeing on the show floor, but just more generally, what, do, what are some of these folks doing in their careers to uh, build up school, skill sets and further their network automation careers. So on the stage, I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves, but uh, next to me, I have Jathan. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, tell people a little bit about uh, what you do. Uh, hi, I'm Jathan McCollum. I'm currently working at Network to Code as Managing Director um, or Consulting Company. I'm uh, a partner with Cisco. Uh, previously, I worked at Dropbox, and years ago, I worked at AOL for almost 13 years. So I've done a lot of large-scale infrastructure automation, uh, focused mostly on security, but moved into just dedicated full-scale network automation these days. So I maintain a couple open source projects in the same space, and i um, kind of passionate about this. <laughs> awesome. I love it. All right. Next up, we have Claudia. Hi, I'm Claudia DeLuna. Uh, started out my career with uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, spent a lot of time there, uh, did some Perl, did some initial configuration work, um, then moved on to, now looking back, quite a number of verticals, um, all useful all um, really key to helping me understand kind of what enterprises go through in terms of any setting a new strategy, including automation. Um, right now, uh, I'm an independent consultant um, working on several large projects, all of them with an automation component. Awesome. And last, Jeremy? Yeah, hi. My name is uh, Jeremy Schulman, <coughs> and I head up the uh, network infrastructure automation at Major League Baseball. And uh, I'm, I'm there three months, so this is my first time being at a customer, like a, an enterprise customer. Uh, before that, I was 20 years at uh, various vendors. And uh, back in 2012, I think, is when I really started dedicating my time focused exclusively on what I would call modern network automation technologies. Awesome. I love it. Um, so since most of us, at least in this field, I think started out in networking and have kind of grown into automation uh, and programmability, um, and certainly correct me if I'm not correct in that, but uh, how did each of you get started in networking to begin with? Because a lot of the folks that listen to this are just now getting, or are fairly early in their networking careers. So I'm curious, what got you into it in the first place? Okay, so uh, I started out out of college as a software engineer, and I spent about 10 years building uh, networking equipment and telecommunications equipment, you know, so the software behind that, so writing protocols and device drivers. And I uh, got into the networking side of it in about the time when ADSL happened, so maybe 2001, uh, when we made the transition into data communications, and that's when I got into more networking than telecom. Awesome. Claudia? So I actually have a slightly different path. Um, I came out of school with a mechanic, well, basically an aero astro degree, um, thinking I'd work for Boeing or one of those. So I wound up at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, but in the software development uh, team um, for the team that actually uh, manipulated all the images that came from a lot of the instrumentation, all the, the Mars rovers. Um, but within a year of that, I was wooed away by the networking team. Uh, I wound up working with them a lot, trying to understand how, our, how the software was going to work across networks and just fell in love with networking. Um, so I actually started in software development, went to networking for the next 20 years, and now it's, for me, the best of both worlds. It's, it couldn't be any better, right, because it's the two things I love all together now. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And Jathan? <clears throat> I was a computer kid and <laughs> knew all about PCs and stuff. I exited high school, joined the Marines. I was a computer specialist in the Marines and that was where I learned TCP IP and networking for the first time. And uh, did some overseas deployments, building networks in a jungle with a satellite uplink. That was fun. Uh, but after I got into the real world, um, started just working in tech and um, kind of just blossomed from there into all types of different areas related to networking security. Um, you know, firewalls, switches, all that stuff. Awesome. And by way of intro, I didn't introduce myself for anyone that's uh, watching. Uh, I am Eric Thiel. I lead the developer advocacy team inside of DevNet. Uh, and I, I'm sure you're familiar already with a lot of the stuff DevNet does uh, from our past streams, but a lot of the folks on those streams are, are on my team and 
we are really focused on bringing groups like this together and figuring out what can we do to further the industry? What, can, what kind of resources can we provide to help people with their automation uh, projects? What kind of learning can we offer, et cetera? So that's my focus, is, is helping curate the team that builds a lot of the content that you're seeing out there. So we're always looking for feedback on that as well, of, of what things we can be doing better, what extra type of, types of things would you like to see? Um, and I got started in it uh, just for, for that question. Um, I actually also went to school, but they were mostly teaching programming back in the day. They didn't really have networking programs. So I learned a little programming, decided I didn't like programming. <laughs> so I got into networking, and now many years later, it's come full circle, and now I actually love programming, <laughs> as long as it's programming against infrastructure. You'd be surprised how many engineers, network engineers I meet that have that exact same background. Yeah, I looked at programming. No, not for me, went into networking. You know, I was the kid that taught her computer science class in high school when her teacher went out on maternity leave, right? <laughs> so it doesn't, I don't understand it at all, but I appreciate that there's a lot of folks like you out there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so then, okay, so you've all gotten into networking now. Uh, what, and maybe this was even before you were into networking, but what's the first kind of thing you can think of that you automated? I'll go first. <clears throat> I think the first thing I remember automating that I can actually associate a solid memory to is when I was at AOL. As I started there in 2000. I was on the network security team. And being onboarded there, they're like, okay, here's how we load ACLs to devices. And they were doing it by hand, like literally going copy to FTP run, you know. And I was like, you do this for every single ACL? And so the first thing I wrote was this script called load ACL. And, <laughs> and it evolved into this thing that could actually do paralyzed loads over, over time. But at the time, before I wrote that, the first version of LoadAcle was you would take a list of devices and run point LoadAcle to it, and it would run to them one by at a time. You hit a syntax error, you hit a connection problem, the thing would crap out. Um, so parallelization at that time was, OK, open four terminals <laughs> with the different subsections of the same <laughs> list of devices. And if it craps out, well, I'll just edit the file, comment them out, and start from where you left off. So over time, that evolved. And so it was written in Perl, by the way. Awesome. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Hi, I share your Perl background. Um, I was really fortunate. Even when I moved into the networking team, um, we had a very rich culture of automation. We actually, speaking of access control list, we automated a system where we needed approval. Uh, there were some very specific guidelines for approving access, you know, security, right? Um, and so we wrote a system to approve if someone wanted to change an access control list. We didn't actually automate the pushing out of the access control list, <laughs> which is odd, but we automated the entire approval process. And we would actually send reminders like nine months before, you know, the, it lasted for every approval, lasted for a year. We would send reminders nine months before to remind people, hey, your, you know, your approval is going to lapse. Do something with it. Uh, for me personally, it was configs because I hate writing configs by hand. And probably because I'm not very good at it, and invariably I will, you know, have errors. So I found if I automated it, I was actually much more accurate in terms of what I was doing, and also in Perl. So um, I think one of the most interesting ones that I can recall doing was back in 2012, we used Ansible. I think we might have been the very first project using Ansible for networking. They were still a company of four people <laughs> back in that time. And we built a, uh, a zero-touch provisioning system for a very large restaurant company that needed to uh, stage equipment at a warehouse before they shipped it off to each of the individual locations. And so we used Ansible to do the template building of the configs and pushing of the configs to devices that uh, a, a tech facilities person could use in a warehouse. Um, I, I like to think that we were the first ones to use Ansible for networking back then, and we helped them you know, sell their first commercial networking deal back then. So that was very exciting. Nice, awesome. I love the uh, the range of time frames and uh, especially some of the older stuff. I mean, yeah, back in the day, a lot of these tools didn't exist that we're using today. Um, I think my first automation project was doing uh, merging mail uh, email lists between MS Mail and uh, Netware Mail. I don't even remember what it was called back then. Um, so I had a bunch of macros in Excel to do it. Um, but I still consider that automation. I mean, it. it oh. It accomplished what I needed to do and saved me countless hours, so. Absolutely, and that's one of the things that's, um, 
not frustrating, but uh, I always find noteworthy is the automation is not new at all. It's been around for many, many years. It was generally kind of a niche, you know, it was the one person who knew how to do it and off they went and did their own thing. Um, so the, the really fun part of it now is that the tool set that we get to use for automation is so much richer and now the devices are coming into play as well. And that wasn't the case, you know, back then. Um, so it's a pretty exciting time. Absolutely. So you bring up a good point. Uh, there are a lot of tools to choose from. It has completely evolved. I mean, obviously, since I'm talking 25 years ago, but even in the past few years, we've seen rapid evolution of a lot of these tool sets. What do you all do to stay on top of it? Like, as, as this is constantly shifting, do you have certain, uh, like, training styles that you find more useful than others? Or what's your go-to if you want to start learning something new? How do, you, how do you accomplish it or how do you tackle it? You want to take I, that one? <laughs> I tend to try to start with project documentation. So if there's a problem that I want to solve, I always try to find out, is, has it already been solved? For, and if so, find, if there's a tool or library out there, could immediately consult the quick start or the cookbook or whatever. Um, I'm fortunate, though, to be a self-starter. I'm very good at teaching myself and learning. I know a lot of people don't learn that way. Um, so I think that's also where those cookbooks and quick start guides come in handy because they're kind of somewhere in the middle where they're slightly visual, they're walking through the process. Um, those have probably been the most value to me. I think followed probably next by, okay, it's not working in the way I want it to, let's consult the source code. And that's trepidatious for some, but sometimes it's the best way to learn, just jumping in there and trying to understand actually what's happening underneath. Yep. I'm very much a learn by example. Um, there's so much out there uh, also in terms of learning and getting you up to speed very quickly. You know, the, there's just an, an amazingly rich set of Python tutorials and lessons and organizations that'll teach you Python. Uh, same with Ansible. Um, I tend to take sort of a, uh, a you know, shotgun approach to it all. Um, I have accounts on Udemy and Pluralsight. DevNet is a tremendously powerful learning tool. Um, most of us actually met uh, when we were talking at Interop, uh, and there I actually had a little presentation that leveraged the sandboxes, the DevNet sandboxes, for getting started. Um, those are the kinds of tools that are just make things so much easier, um, really lessen your, your learning curve, because you don't have to worry about that whole lab aspect, right? You've got an iOS box, you've got an NXOS box, you've got an ACI controller out there uh, that you can leverage and test whatever you need to on. So thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and yeah, we appreciate it. We love that you're using it. That's, uh, we're very passionate about trying to put the technology in people's hands, reducing barriers to actually being able to learn and teach yourself new skills. So yeah, it's tremendously useful because not only do you have all of the DevNet capabilities and tutorials and training that's out there, but you're letting you know, independent folks like me contribute. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, um, the way I've been looking at learning new technologies is to really follow what the, the DevOps folks were doing. This is what I was doing back in 2012 when I you know, started working with Puppet and Chef and, and these types of tools. And uh, before uh, I even knew about those tools, you know, I had no idea what that world was, was investing their time in. And then once I saw what Puppet and Chef you know, were in terms of the, the technologies, I, uh, I said, you know, look, this is going to hit us in networking some way, somehow. And so I've always been watching what they've been doing and learning what they've been building. And so now, you know, you look at the Dockers and the Terraforms and all the cloud technologies. And, and really what they're spending a lot of their time focusing on is this dis distributed systems application development. Well, to me, that's what the network is. It, you know, we have a very complex distributed system. And so I look at all the tools that they're using and building and, and kind of to Jason's point, is there a tool out there that we can leverage that solves the problem or at least learn the techniques? And so that's kind of my broad strategy. And then every day I just kind of watch Twitter. <laughs> you know, I have like this hit list of folks that I just watch, you know, in the systems, in, you know, the systems, DevOps, uh, distributed systems, you know, networking. And I just see this broad range of all these tools and technology. And it's just, you know, every day I spend probably an hour just reading and researching as just part of the rhythm of my own business. That's nice. actually a very good point. Um, one of the things I like to do uh, when I can, like Sunday afternoon, just allow maybe a couple hours and just start with the folks that I generally monitor and just see where it takes me. And that just, just kind of hopping around, reading stuff. I have found things I never knew existed, right? There's a whole consortium on how Excel is evil, right? Um, <laughs> 
I'm not kidding, it's, <laughs> it's real, uh, both, that it's evil and there's a consortium about it. Um, and that that's the kind of stuff that you just wind up tripping over and you're like, wow, this is fantastic. So giving yourself that latitude to not always be, you know, maybe goal-driven, like, that's probably not a good thing to say, right? But just let yourself wander out there is incredibly valuable, I have found. Yeah, but I, I want to like hit on something that Jason said, which was when you're looking at technology or projects or whatever, the documentation is first and foremost so critical because you know you have a limited amount of time usually to do whatever it is that you're trying to do. You know, everybody's working at 120 percent, and if you're trying to figure something out, if that documentation doesn't have like a quick start where I could literally you know, within five minutes go, yep, this is what I need, or I make a decision that I want to spend another hour of looking at it. So anybody who's building, you know, uh, community-driven things like, you know, the DevNet effort, there's so much great documentation, it's really very engaging, and then there's a whole bunch of other stuff out there that just, you know, they just don't do that uh, effort, and then maybe it was a good project, but, you know, I just, I just kind of drive right past it, you know? It's a big message. Like, yeah. You have to remember when you're writing software who you're writing it for yeah. and why did you write it. Do you want people to use it? How should they be using it? Yeah. So it's like write your docs. Well, and you have to really reduce <laughs> the friction. It's sort of like yeah. you know, I look at it as like how much friction is it for me to like adopt this piece of technology. And if they don't spend the energy doing the documentation, then I feel that you know, it's a lot of friction. I don't want to spend three hours trying to figure out hello world with some library. So you mentioned friction, and I think that's uh, an interesting thought to maybe drill into. Is what are what are some what's some friction or what are some challenges you're actually seeing at organizations um, when they're trying to develop their automation strategy? Like how who's being successful, who isn't? What kind of causes are you seeing for that? Yeah, so I've been looking at this problem, you know, for about almost six, seven years, going back to 2012. And, um, and now that I've been in a, you know, what I would consider a large enterprise organization, um, I can distill, the, I like to distill this answer down into kind of two elements. Uh, a company is either interested in automation or they're actually committed to it. And the way I, I measure commitment to a network automation strategy is, is kind of two ways. They'll either uh, place a software engineering type of person like myself or Jason with the network engineers to help them build or build tools for them or to, to basically be that mentor uplift. So they'll either hire a new resource or I think that uh, they could dedicate time like an ops cycle, like a network engineer is put into like an ops week, you know, you're on ops duty. If they would do a DevOps duty, so now, you know, the company is committing a time for that network engineer to learn uh, new skills or develop the automation tools or use automation tools because without a dedicated amount of time set aside for network engineers, they're already working at 120%. So that's the difference between interested, you know, yeah, sure, learn it on your own. Yeah, sure, maybe we'll do it. Or the company is committing time and money uh, to that effect. It has to be driven from the top. The <laughs> Claudia and I were <laughs> mincing about this before the, we started the panel. Uh, the, you, you, ha you have to change the culture. And a lot of times the culture has to be driven from the top. That doesn't mean that the people and, on teams are also responsible, but uh, it, you have to have an, uh, an adoption strategy. And so part of this is like, okay, we're going to automate things. Cool. Now what? Are you going to use them? Are you going to put them into production? Or are they just going to sit there latent in your test and your staging environment? And that's, a, that's critical. And that's the kind of thing that does have to be driven by leadership because they have to allow it to happen. They have to open the gates to unblock certain processes. And especially larger enterprise customers that have, have been doing things the old school way and have a network engineering team of hundreds of people but barely have any automation, they, they often don't know where to start. And that's the scary part, I think, in a lot of... So it's like, you have to answer those questions. Who, who are we going to hire? Are we hiring the right people? If we don't have the right people, how do we get them? But more importantly, adoption is key. Otherwise, you have wrote all the coolest software in the world. If nobody's using it, it was pointless. That's actually one of the key points. As I've evolved, um, the thing that's valuable to me now is if I put together a process or a set of scripts, that others use. Now, you know, before when I first started out, it was, oh, well, look what I did with this script. Mm -hmm. and, and now it's less that and much more, okay, I have a goal, I have these functions that I have to um, execute on. 
can I write something that others, um, my teammates, um, my clients will actually take and use? And I think we have to start shifting from the, you know, the individual hero mindset that many of us, I think, have. And, and I think we're good engineers because we have that mindset. But now it's, yes, but now look at what we can collectively do. Because in, in a company that's global, right, uh, I'm not up 24 hours a day. Um, so the ability to execute on whatever uh, in, you know, in every region of the world independently and consistently, that's huge. And for me nowadays, that's the value I'm bringing to my clients and the organizations that I'm working with. It's not just, hey, look what I did for you. It's here's this process that we built for you that all of your team can execute and run on. And honestly, uh, some of the announcements here at the show today really dovetail and, and give me sort of uh, ammunition to go that because now that we've got some real net DevNet certifications, right, back to uh, Jeremy's point, it's that investment, and it's no less an investment now in automation than it was for your CCNA, your CCIE. It's as, as an equal, and you need the time to make that investment. And I think with that, and now companies maybe can start seeing that it is that level of commitment. That's an awesome point, and actually a good time to talk about it. I am going to pause temporarily to point out uh, this is a rare occasion. We do actually get to have a live audience in person for this, so if anyone in the audience does have questions, feel free to come talk to Tom, and uh, he, can, uh, he can figure out if, uh, if the question should be rolled up to us to answer. Um, but uh, I did want to, uh, since you mentioned certifications and something that you mentioned, Jathan, about... Uh, um, about knowing who to have on the team of the right resources. Um, for those of you who might not have tuned into the live stream yesterday, we did announce now there is a, a track for DevNet certifications. So there is a DevNet certified associate, DevNet certified professional, and in the future we are looking to add a DevNet uh, certified expert, which is following the same similar uh, styles as the CCNA, CCMP, CCIE, and expected expertise. So, uh, with those coming out, do you, what do you guys think? What do you think about them? Like, you, obviously, you guys didn't know about it ahead of time. It was a big uh, drop on the main stage yesterday. Um, what's your first thoughts on it? I'm really excited about it. Um, I'm already thinking years in the future where this is a curriculum that could be offered to high school students. Because I have a cousin of mine who took a CCNA and as part of a high school course, and you know, he entered into college with already some basic understanding of how to do networking. So imagine. This is the kind of thing that's moving not only the industry, but the, us as a generation forward to, you know, as, as menial tasks get automated away, having a younger people having access to this type of curriculum is incredibly inspiring. So I'm excited by it. The other thing um, that I think is valuable to note is that, you know, there was this kind of hysteria about is my job going to just, am I going to, you know, just be automated out of my own job as a network engineer? <laughs> That's never going to happen. Never going right? to happen. Good network engineers will always be needed. It's just how we do things. It's just a change in, in how we execute our day-to-day -day functions. Um, and so having kind of this certification track, I hope, also highlights that it's, it's just a gro the, the natural growth of a network engineer, not the replacement of a network engineer by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, first, I think it's great. I think it really demonstrates, you know, Cisco's thought leadership from the, from the highest level all the way down. I mean, I look around the DevNet floor here, which is about the size of two football fields worth of, you know, everything, and the crush of people that are here is just mind-blowing to me because five years ago, you could maybe get 100 people in a room to maybe talk about how interesting it was. So, I mean, from the, from the DevNet and the Cisco investment from the top down, it's, it's phenomenal. I agree with the points that you've made about providing a, a journey and a path for people to kind of come up and learn these new technologies in a structured way that allows companies to, you know, make budget and assign time and energy for people to put into it. And it also allows network engineers, to your point, to, some of them are going to become tool builders. You know, they want to build tools for their teams or otherwise. And other people are going to be domain experts in networking. And it's not, I don't think it's rational or realistic to say somebody can do both, honestly. I mean, because of the complexities of, of networking and, and all the different domains. So some people are going to specialize in tool building and some people are going to, you know, be domain experts. Just the same way you have doctors, they don't build their own MRI units, you know, they, they know how to use the information that these very sophisticated tools you know, provide them. And in networking, 
really we've been lacking very sophisticated tools. We've always been the, the cobbler's children have no shoes, <laughs> you know, kind of scenario. Even at companies that have dedicated infrastructure automation teams are always focused not on networking. So I think this is, uh, this is great. It's, it's really fantastic. Awesome. Well, we're, we're definitely glad. We're, we're looking forward to a lot of community feedback. We want this to be a very impactful certification. We think it already is, um, but uh, we, we love the feedback, so definitely keep that coming. Uh, you did mention the DevNet Zone. We are here in the middle of the DevNet Zone coming to you live. Uh, there are uh, lots of workshops. Um, so for those of you that can attend, um, uh, lots of interesting stuff that you can pick up. I want to um, I want to ask you guys: Are there any general themes you've been picking up in the sessions you've gone through so far? Um, anything that you think is starting to bubble up? Maybe uh, that's starting to a new direction or new and interesting things coming up on so, the floor. So I would like to say that what I've been seeing is there's something for everybody. There, you know, if you're just getting started, there are some great sessions. If they're if you're you know, kind of far down the path of, of this journey already, there's more intermediate and advanced topics uh, that you can really learn. Um, so I'm, I'm finding you know, there's information out there that you know, I'm like, wow, I didn't know that. That's great. But, and then more importantly, you're starting to meet people who are the experts in all the business units. So if you have tough questions, there are people here that are sitting you know, in the workshops that you know, after you see the sessions, you can ask really hard questions. So there is something for everybody here. Not just, it's not just beginner level material that you usually see at conferences, and it's not you know, super advanced stuff that everybody's like rolling their eyes because they don't know Python. There's, there's really something for everybody here, and it's really great to see that broad spectrum of, of workshops and tutorials and classes. Awesome. I have to say, for the last four years, I've come to Cisco Live and exclusively just participated in DevNet. Um, and this year in particular, I'm finding that there's a lot more, uh, there's less reticence to actually engaging in kind of a conversations about automation, which to me really s gives me a sense that it's, the momentum is, is, is building and building and building. Um, and the nice thing about being in this community, right, is that you are here with like-minded people who you can have those discussions with. I'm seeing a lot more, a lot more of those conversations happening. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Great. I've been chasing this dragon for a long time, <laughs> the phrase network automation. And you know, you, years ago, telling people, well, what do you do? Oh, I don't do network automation. Their eyes glaze over. <laughs> and for me, I'm just excited to see that's like part of the common vocabulary now. And yeah. it's like, yeah. it's arrived, finally, yeah, yeah, yeah. for all these years. Yeah. And it's just cool to be here. So yeah. thanks. Awesome. Well, we do have a, a question from the audience. If, uh, if Tom, you want to uh, ask it. Yeah, we've got some really good questions coming in. I'll put the panel on the spots if I can. Um, one of them that's really interesting is how are you seeing um, enterprises consume um, net DevOps and uh, network automation? Are you seeing them have uh, a new department created around network automation or is it an evolution of their current networking team? Yeah, I mean, I'd like to take that. I mean, I, there's, there's no one answer. I, I've seen, you know, even over the last few years, some companies they'll try to put software engineers in the networking team and try to create synergy there. In some cases, uh, you know, it's kind of ad hoc. The, the network engineers are taking the, their own initiative to learn it. Um, I, you know, until very recently, I hadn't seen like dedicated strategy put in place because you know, five years ago, people thought network automation, yeah, it's nice to have, but we don't really need it. It's not critical to our business. And now, you know, large, large enterprises are realizing that the networking engineering department and, and operations is now part of the broad IT workflow. And now they're looking for ways to reduce the friction between each of these silos. And so it's becoming you know, very critical for some to have that capability. That's our biggest challenge, I find. Um, like you've seen, there's a little bit of everything. I've seen the, you know, kind of the, the, the tiger team that's an additional duty for everyone in a variety of silos. You know, that tends not to, and they all sit around in a room, you know, I, and I, I, I join them to teach them about network automation. They're like, yeah, we're not quite sure why we're here. Um, you're done. Oh, there's one more thing I forgot. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'll lose, go, go, I'll go. lose it. The one thing I found that doesn't work Okay, because I think this is really kind of an interesting thing. You know, people ask, well, what works? I, I'd like to say what doesn't work. 
because I've seen this again and again. It, it goes back to the cobbler's children have no shoes. I've seen large enterprises have infrastructure teams, you know, software tools teams. And when I'd go talk to the networking people, they're like, we need these better tools. And I said, well, why don't you go talk to your tools team? And they said, well, they're really busy, you know, building, you know, whatever it is that the, the business needs that has nothing to do with the networking. And, you know, yeah, we put in a feature request for that tools team and they have to, well, we're backlogged six months. And a network engineer, when they need a tool for a new build or some new troubleshooting tool, they need it, you know, right away. And so, you know, if you work at a large enterprise company and you say, well, you know, we've got this tools team, it'll be great. It's not, you know, that doesn't seem to work. That's very true. And that's going to be the biggest challenge as we try and take this, this whole thing right to the next step is understanding that inertia that a large enterprise has and how to work through it. Um, I know you've got a lot of experience with that. Um, the tools are there. They're maturing. I think all of us as a, as a network engineer and automation engineer um, community are maturing and it really Breaking down those silos in an organization uh, is just the culture is sometimes, uh, it's, it, it seems like it's never going to happen. That's our next challenge, I think. Yeah, so there's this advent of the NRE or the Network Reliability Engineer, which is, you think of like SRE as Site Reliability Engineer, aka DevOps Engineer. And I think that's a really important role because it's distinct from Network Engineer in the same way that sysadmin is distinct from DevOps or SRE. Like, nobody's a sysadmin anymore. You're not just, like, going to build a server by hand anymore. Then you should be building network gear by hand anymore. And I think that's the real important key here is, like, sure, you might have a traditional network engineering organization, but it's never too late to start adding developers into the mix or encouraging or training your engineers to learn how to code. But it comes back to the thing I said before about adoption. Sure, okay, you just sent all your engineers to training. Are they using it? Yeah. How can you make sure that they are? And that's really the key there is you have to have kind of like a sliding scale, like networking on one side and development on the other. Somewhere in between is the perfect NRE, but you're never going to find that person. Yeah. So you have to cultivate it. Yeah, it, yeah and I, I love this question. Um, do you see any ways of integrating documentation and documentation standards into network automation? Documentation is close to my heart, so I'm quite interested in oh, this I'll one. Oh, I'll take this one. <laughs> so I, I came of age, right, in the world of, uh, you know, Visio um, and Excel. I think some of you already know how I feel about that. And my <laughs> single goal in life right now is to basically get rid of those tools. I don't ever want to use Excel again. I don't ever want to use Visio again. Don't get me wrong. A well-documented network diagram, a network and network diagram are invaluable. But why do I have to sit there and and you know put IP addresses on little boxes? And honestly, I spend a lot of those Sunday afternoons uh, that I mentioned, where I kind of wander through trying to figure out how I can automate my way out of Visio. Um, I already know how to automate my way out of Excel. I just need to build a tool that other network engineers will adopt. Um, so, yeah, I think that level of documentation has got to be um, critical to everything that we do. Because how many of you have handed over a set of documents when you've done a network? And before you even, before the ink dries, if you will, they're no longer valid. They've changed. And it's, it's ridiculous to invest so much time and effort into those, those things that are just static. You know, and the minute you put them down, you should walk away from them because they're no longer, no longer valid. Yeah, so a, a kind of a riff on what you just said, um, I would take it even a step further back, which is what I think our industry is really lacking is design engineering tooling. You know, if the, you know like an architect has a CAD system, they, they design a house, and from that CAD drawing, something can get rendered out, like the blueprints, you know, the documentation. Yep. I, I have yet to see a real design engineering tool you know, that allows a network engineer to use that tool to design their network where rules can be placed to it that says, yes, this house is solid or conforms to the building code of San Diego in a sense. And then it is used to build your pictures, to create your configs, to validate your network, you know, but it has to start with the design, like a design tool. We don't, we don't have such a tool that exists in our industry like CAD, you know, for architects. Um, and, and I think if somebody, you know, if, if that kind of tool existed, uh, we would get the documentation, you know, quote, for free, uh, yep. so to speak, because trying to build those tools ourselves, I think, is, is really irrational. Yeah. So I just want to throw a soundbite out there. <laughs> the documentation 
error or lack of documentation is a bug in your software. Yeah. Yeah. It's so bad documentation is probably worse than no documentation, but document everything. Yeah. <laughs> and file them as bugs in your software, in your <laughs> issue tracker. But that is a very good question, and um, that really completes the picture. And if you think about how automation happens today, you have to define all those, all those parameters, the VLANs that the box needs, the subnetting, what have you, right, the name. And so we're, we're so well positioned to just crank out the documentation. The other thing I see though that's uh, an impediment to that though is, it is actually accepting documentation that doesn't look like Visio. How many SOWs have you all seen that require a Visio diagram? You know? <laughs> Um, and that's, so again, having to, to change that mindset in the industry that this is better because you can regenerate it at a moment's notice, right? You don't have to put some poor guy there to update to, you know, the right colors or whatever. Um, so I love the question. Thank you for asking that one. Yeah. We, got one more? we got one more and it's uh, from John. I'm going to hand the mic over to John who will ask about uh, NetSecOps. Yeah, so NetSec DevOps, uh, where do you see the security DevOps leading with the development of SOAR applications, security, uh, security orchestration automation and response applications? You've got a security background. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. In the bigger picture of <laughs> the long tail of network autonomics, which is beyond automation, uh, things like auto remediation and defense are incredibly important. If you think about the way that we're doing, just leave as a simple example, you have an Ansible playbook that can generate a configuration and push it to a device and then do some kind of post check to make sure that the config that you generated is actually live on the device. That is a way of auditing. It's, a, it's an auditing pattern, right? Compliance check, an audit check, and then perhaps a, a remediation. Um, if you think about that workflow itself, this is, can apply to any security paradigm, except it's just a a different realm of, of knowledge. And I, I think, I'm glad you asked that, because security automation is in probably more important, especially as you, your, the size of your network grows, you have to know what's on your network. So that the premise of visibility is another big one there. And if you're doing your monitoring, your graphing, uh, you know, are your configs in the right place? Is your source of truth reliable? All of these are vectors to attacks. And so the better you get at having uniformity the easier it is to secure. Hopefully that partially answered your question. <laughs> well, what I see is that the tool sets we've been talking about actually dovetail perfectly into what is one of the more critical aspects of networking, right? Is securing that network. Uh, so how many times have you seen, well, you must, pu you must put in this configuration because this is what, you know, what my security team mandates. Who goes back and makes sure that it didn't change you know, an hour after you laid it in? Nobody. Um, so the tools that we've been talking about here today are going to help us with not just regular day-to-day -day stuff, but also laying in configs that, that don't wander off of their stated path, which they tend to do. Yeah, the way I look at that, and I'm not a security expert, but I've spent time doing you know, automation with firewalls uh, and such. I think you know, dialing it back is, in security, the most important thing when we look at network automation is rationalizing you know, fear and surprise. You know, that's... You know, fear and surprise is what drives a lot of what happens with the security practice. And what that means then is, is any technology that we use, whether we buy a commercial product or something's developed in-house, the, the level of care built around that tool has to be at a higher degree, meaning people are going to trust this tool, they're going to trust this software, because your business is at risk if that tool fails. And so if, if a business is asking their network engineer to develop that kind of tool, they're already going down the wrong path, you know, because the, the nature of care that has to go into a tool like that is such a high degree uh, that the fear and surprise of failure is too detrimental. So it's a, it's a really interesting L area of, of our IT that I think people really need to focus very careful on how to even approach creating a solution to that problem. I love it. Yeah, I, so this was a conversation we had on, uh, I had in one of my other sessions, and a, one of the other things that I see as being important, and it's not necessarily directly to your question, but still on the security front, is the ability for accountability and for auditing and measuring compliance and tracking it all. Like, anytime I touch a device, I capture so much stuff in my script that gets thrown away. Disk space is cheap. 
So if I just log everything, then I can start building tools that can consume that. So whether it's looking for things like PCI compliance, and I can go back and I see configs, dozens of configs throughout the day, and I can pinpoint exactly when a change was made, or uh, I can prove that throughout that day or throughout the entire year there was no violation of a certain rule that I couldn't have a certain config. Like This is a whole new world where all I have to do is save the info. I already have it. And yeah. And it's free to store for all practical purposes. Yeah, and there's something I want to come back to, which was you know impediments to you know the strategy of network automation at a company. Uh, there's a, an element of top down that has to happen as well, not just the bottom up. And it kind of goes to this this kind of question about you know what should the network engineering people really be building versus buying, and and how does how does a network engineer even quantify? The, the level of effort that you know some ask is going to happen you know a, a manager might say well you know we, we just need to you know automate you know blah 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 you know <laughs> validate the network is okay make a config happen validate the network is okay afterwards and you know in their mind that's like going to a restaurant and ordering a meal right it's you know throw some money at it meal happens and and so actually having the ability to quantify the the level of complexity and risk of of building tools you know and using them is not, a, is not in the domain of a network engineering manager. So you, know, you have to kind of think about that. How does, how does a network engineer quantify you know, risk and complexity for the task that they're being asked to do? And software engineers kind of have a practice behind doing that you know, through their own domain, but it's completely you know, new to the networking world. And I think if you don't set the right expectations from the top down, you're setting up people to fail. And, and that's discouraging. You just made me think of one other thing, is that draconian security policies can make your network worse and less secure. And, and I've seen that a lot, whereas like, the security policy at a company is actually counter to automation. And therefore, it's hobbling itself in the fact that it's like, well, we've isolated these data centers so that, from each other so that we can't make sure that they don't get hacked. Or if one gets hacked, then it's only isolated that data center. It's like, yeah, but where are your configs? If you lose that data center, those configs are locked in that data center. Oh, yeah, I guess we didn't think about that. <laughs> or, okay, how about your visibility? You have bifurcated monitoring systems and bifurcated alarms, and you have to have bifurcated jump posts to get into those systems. It's like, you're not going to automate that, and therefore you're limiting your ability to adapt and react to events that happen. So you have to think about, so you have to be security-minded at all times. I'm really glad you asked this question. And like I was saying before, Uniformity begets security. But then also, you, you highlight a good point, is that we have to start thinking of it as a system. And I don't think anybody really, it's difficult to do that. And we think of disciplines, right? And we have the server team and security team. But it is actually a system. And it needs to behave as a system. And that, like developing a network automation strategy, is another daunting task on our plate. Jeremy, I like something that you called out that we do need to look at leadership uh, skill sets as well in this transition. It sounds like maybe an opportunity for Cisco certified DevNet manager uh, going forward. We'll have to look into that one. Uh, no commitments here. but uh, um, All right. Well, I know we're winding down. I do want to uh, get some final thoughts from each of you on uh, how do you think automation in general fits for today's network engineer? If they aren't getting started with it yet, like how... How should they be approaching it from their job? Should they be diving head first? Should they just start dabbling? How critical is it going to be to them? I'll let you kind of spin it how you see. Yeah, yeah, I love this question. So uh, if you're just getting started, here, here's what you know, I would recommend. One, uh, invest in a good editor like PyCharm, you know, because it's going to give you a lot of benefit to if you're writing code, that kind of thing. And then two, you know, if you're starting out with what isn't the first thing I should write or automate, you know, what is my hello world? You know, I, I think that uh, the rhythm of most businesses are actually Excel spreadsheets. You know, they're passing Excel spreadsheets from point A to point B, team to team to team. So if you can use, uh, you know, practice your skill set of like, extracting data out of spreadsheets and transforming that data into whatever you need, it is a, almost a zero w risk activity. You know, you're not touching the network, you're not breaking anything, you're practicing a, a development skill. Uh, you know, maybe not Excel, maybe Google Sheets, but the idea is, is that that type of document is the level of abstraction in most enterprises. And if you're just getting started and you really want to start, you know, playing with programming, I think that's kind of a great hello world place to get started. 
It is. You'll see um, most things start with uh, generate a config, mostly for the same reasons, right? Low risk, uh, good, good to kind of you know, take a big bite of, um, but you're not going to really mess anything up. It gets you uh, interested in or gets you familiar with a lot of the tools. Um, that's a good one, but I do think that uh, Matt Oswald actually asked this at Interop, right? Uh, what should your hello world be? Uh, and I guess my point here would be don't limit yourself to what you see out there that's generally available. To your point, one of the most valuable scripts that I've written recently is a script, I kid you not, because I can't make this stuff up, <laughs> that takes five different Excel spreadsheets and a set of show commands and basically merges them into one report so that all the different disciplines can look at this one report and understand, OK, uh, this VLAN, it's going to change to this VLAN. Uh, OK, the VLAN stays the same, but it's going to change subnet. I mean, literally. And that is so valuable in one of the projects I'm currently on right now. And I'm not making this up, right? It's so unsexy, right? <laughs> I, I, I cringe that I even mentioned it to you here. But don't let me yourself to what you see out there. Pick a problem that you think you can you know, make a credible stab at and just get started. I have two things to say. One, your code is good enough. Yeah. I, I, so many people yeah. face when they're newcomers yeah. to programming, they're like, well, show me your code. Ah, I don't want to show it to you. You're really good at it. And I'm, be, I'm embarrassed. It's like, no, it's not like that. Totally agree. Don't be scared. Put your code on GitHub if it's, if it's not proprietary. Um, but the other one was, um, you know your job, and you know what sucks about your job. Pick something small to automate that you do all the time that annoys the hell out of you. That's always a good use case, especially if it's something that's not going to actually affect production. Like if it's something you're just a bunch of show commands that you will always run, well, maybe write a little tool that can do that. Start there, uh, and then just take it from there, and the, you know the wheels will get turning. But just again, don't be scared. Your code is good enough. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree more. And uh, I'll just add one more thing for any. A lot of you weren't able to make the uh, my session yesterday or the panel, but uh, celebrate the small victories. Like that first time you log into a device. That is success, because every other script you're ever going to write has to start there. So don't think, oh, I can't write this big monolithic app. That small victory, you know, your code is good enough. You got it, a device logged into. Next, maybe you do a show version. That can provide value for you. So I appreciate you all taking the time out of your day, sharing a lot of your insights. Uh, hopefully the crowd found that interesting and, and helpful. And uh, hopefully everyone enjoys the rest of Cisco Live that's here. We look forward to seeing you all next week online on the next De De DevOps Live. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.